So our next speaker is uh, Kristen, and she's an expert in applying different and novel mass spectrometry technologies to study uh, molecular mechanisms in dynamic systems, uh, such as uh, many different relevant biomedical systems that we're interested in, as well as the environment. Uh, and we're interested and excited to hear more about uh, some of her work today. So yeah. thank you. Thank you so much. And I'll try to keep Brian's energy going, keep everyone awake here. Um, let me put in presentation. Got it. Well, I want to thank Nikolai for the fantastic conference and the organizing committee for the opportunity to speak here. And I'm going to be talking about, whoops, that is very sensitive. There. Okay, that wasn't me. Um, I'm going to be talking about Pacific Northwest. Let's see, where's the laser pointer in here? Here it is. So Pacific Northwest National Laboratories, microscale metabolomic and proteomic imaging for complex systems. Okay, so how are we doing these microscale measurements? Well, we're doing it with MIPI here. So metabolome informed proteome imaging, because what's the point of building a workflow if you can't give it a cute acronym for a name? So, you know, we're at a single cell conference. All of you guys know. Sorry. It's okay. I'm good at winging it. Good? Okay. Okay, so we're at a single cell conference. All of you guys know that complex samples, of course, they are not homogeneous. They're very heterogeneous. And what we're interested in, we're not going single cell scale, but we're interested in mapping microhabitats that change in molecular composition over both space and time. So first, for my presentation, I'm gonna dedicate the first few slides to kind of go back in time and talk about one of our, our older studies that was funded by NIH to look at mammalian tissue sections. And really I'm doing that to set the, the stage as to why we developed our MIPI platform. Then I'm gonna move over to environmental systems, uh, which is funded by Department of Energy, and really discuss why we need these metabolome informed or MIPI analyses for complex environmental samples. So remember I said we're going back in time. So 2020, uh, this was our proof of concept, Nanopots imaging manuscript. Of course, if it has the word Nanopots in it, we're collaborating with Ryan and Ying. Uh, so in this proof of concept, proteome-wide imaging across the tissue section using the bottom-up Nanopots proteomic workflow, uh, we analyzed uterine cross-sections from pregnant mice prior to the adhesion of early embryos. If you look at our Picture here, we have multiple different cell types. So we have stroma in pink, glandular epithelium in green, and luminal epithelium in blue here. Our tissue thickness, 12 microns thick. Each pixel is 100 microns by 100 microns. We had about 30 to 60 cells per each pixel then. And we were able to get uh, around 2,300 proteins identified, um, which is great for 2020. You guys are really advancing in the field even more, which is fantastic. Okay, so for our overall workflow for this one, what we're doing is laser capture micro dissection. We get our pixels, 100 microns tall, 100 microns wide, 12 microns thick. We're using our nanopots uh, chip to do all the processing in 200 nanoliters. And this is uh, Ying and Ryan's uh, proof of concept uh, paper on nanopots that all you guys are familiar with from 2018 when they were both at PNNL. So we're doing all the proteomic processing steps there in nanopots. We're getting really high protein coverage, not losing our sample, high digestion kinetics. We then move over to our nanopots or our nanoproteomic uh, liquid chromatography, tandem mass spectrometry analyses. And from this, we're building quantitative protein maps. So I love imaging anything, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. I think it's true. So for this, this is just an example, you know, showing the, the proteome landscape for one particular protein where red is high relative abundance, green is low relative abundance. Okay, so one thing we were really excited for, we saw lots of cool changes uh, with this, but we could take our data and we could put it into enzymatic pathways. So here we can see this particular enzyme, cytosolic phospholipase A2, is involved in arachidonic acid metabolism. And we can see it's localizing to the luminal epithelial. Remember, red's high, green's low. This is the luminal epithelium here. 
Then we, what it does is it takes phospholipids, if they have a arachidonic acid fatty acid chain, it cleaves it off, it takes that, and then it can process it into really important effector molecules. And these are the things that is the function that we're interested in. So we have LOX, you know, metabolites, we have prostaglandins over here that we're especially interested in. But one question that come, kept coming to mind, you can see the enzymes, but are they actually active? Just because there's an enzyme there, it doesn't mean that has activity with it. So at the time we were doing this study, we were actually uh, collaborating with Ingla at Uppsala University. So we took sections from this exact same mouse uterine tissue and sent it over to Uppsala in Sweden. And there, Ingla uh, was trying new ways to advance prostaglandin imaging. And I don't have to explain anodesi because Neil did a fantastic job. You're mowing the lawn and you're getting these prostaglandin images. And it's hard to tell because they're oriented differently, but we could see prostaglandin E2, really important molecule. We want to know it was there. We could see it's probably being synthesized and it's down here. And it is also localizing to the luminal epithelium. So we've got fantastic. We're not just showing presence, we're showing activity. And that's what we want to see. So we thought to ourselves, okay, well, what if we combine these approaches? If first we look at microhabitats that contain activities of interest, and then we use our bottom-up proteomic workflow on these microscale regions to reveal what proteins and enzymes are present and responsible for making these. And that's how MIPI or metabolome informed proteome imaging was born. Now, when you're dealing with environmental samples like we study, we study microbiomes a lot. You don't have cell types. You don't even know what you're looking at half the time. So really by using the metabolites to show where that activity is, we can use we can gain so much more information from it. So here, if you look at some of the studies we're interested in, everything from microscopic insight guts, we're all familiar with the human microbiome. Um, we're interested in soils, riverbeds, you know, plant systems, anything that has consortia, consortia exerting a function. So consortia has microbes, so it has fungi, bacteria, viruses, all mixed together doing a function or a phenotype of interest. So this is going to resonate with everyone that's interested in the single cell community. So how do we you know, study these? They're complex, they're heterogeneous. Well, what we need to do is we need to have, I'm going to fall off the stage, um, we need to have spatially constrained microscale measurements to study these complex environmental systems. So most phenotypes are observed at a global level. So we, we see that, that you know, phenotype of interest, that function, but many different cell types or species contribute differentially to this global phenotype. So what we need to do is we need to increase the spatial granularity of their measurements to enable the understanding of how each component of a system contributes to the overall phenotype. And that's what MIPI can do. So MIPI can map specific locations of metabolic activity in a biological system. So you're probably looking at this picture right here going, well, what the heck is that? You know, visually it's very complex. Molecularly, it's even more complex. So this is one of the systems we study uh, for part of my Department of Energy early career research. And it's a leaf cutter ant fungal garden ecosystem. And it's a pretty fun system. So the reason why we're interested in this is this phenotype or its function that we want to understand is efficient plant deconstruction. So we want to mechanistically understand how this is occurring. So it's late in the day. It's a really fun system. Let's dedicate a few slides just to talk about it. So leafcutter ants, so they're dominant herbivores that can consume as much as 17% of the leaf biomass produced in neotropical ecosystems. So a neotropical ecosystem is the rainforest. And if you just visualize in your mind how much lush plant material is in the rainforest, when you think of those pictures, 17% is a, a very notable amount. So we wanna understand how these guys are efficiently degrading or consuming that plant material. Now, you might also think, um, you know, I'm a biochemist, I am not an entomologist. So when I first started studying this, I was thought, okay, I've seen pictures like this in National Geographic, the ants eat the leaves. They, they chew them up and they eat them. Well, they don't. Um, they're actually little tiny farmers and they use the leaves as a substrate to grow this fungal garden. 
But the name fungal garden is actually misleading. If you think of the garden itself, it of course has ants, it has plants, it has fungus, but it also has a resident bacterial community. And all these different components are working together very heterogeneously in the system to produce high value bioproducts. So this system is huge in nature. Uh, we want to have something that was better controlled so what we do is we collaborate with Margaret and Cameron. Margaret's pictured here uh, from University of Wisconsin-Madison so that we can have laboratory kept systems. So, so we know exactly what's feeding into them. Okay, so this is our question. How does this fungal garden ecosystem break down plant material at the molecular level? Well, you know, you have these complex ecosystems such as these fungal gardens, you have microhabitats. So that's what we want to understand. They have different species, resources, and activities. And if you look here, I've just zoomed in an example. So here we can see a leaf piece undergoing digestion in the garden. So that's a microhabitat we want to analyze, but it's at a very small scale. And if we used our traditional bulk analysis, so if we did bulk proteomics and metabolomics, then we would average molecules, not just from cell types, but from ants, from plants, from diverse bacterial and fungal species. And as we all know, as a single cell community, averaging is bad. It creates noise in our mass spectrometry data and it dilutes the low abundant pathways of interest, often making them undetectable. So we need to do better. We need to get to the micro scale and you guys are pushing single cell scale. So what we want to do is we want to understand the relationship between the species specific activities in this multi-member ecosystem here. And to do that, we need our new methods. And that's what MIPI is doing. So MIPI is taking our activity of region or our microhabitat with our activity of interest here that we've highlighted. And what we can do is we can map what microbes, what enzymes, what proteins, what lipids, what metabolites and activities can be correlated with this microscale region. And this is the level of detail we need to mechanistically understand pathways. Okay, and I've highlighted Maria down here. Um, she did the majority of the MIPI work that you're gonna see. Um, but before I got into it, a lot of people here probably wondering, why do you care about plant degradation? Why is that important uh, for Department of Energy Resource? Um, and if we see here, we have a cell wall of a plant. Now a cell wall of a plant is made up of polymers. These polymers are really hard to break down. These ones are slightly easier. You have sugar polymers, so you have hemicellulose and cellulose, but you also have lignin, which is an aromatic comp polymer that is especially difficult to break down. Now, the reason why we want to understand how this system breaks it down is because we want high value bioproducts. So we want to take renewable resources like plant material. We want to figure out how natural systems efficiently break them down. And we want to learn from nature so that we can do bio-based fuels, bio-based materials, bio-based chemicals. So of course it can decrease our dependence on petroleum products, but it also helps the economy because we can switch it to more of a bioeconomy. You know, these high value bioproducts can be used for plastics, a whole host of things that can help us out. Okay, big picture here. But when you look at MIPI in general, I'm gonna take you through it. So remember it's metabolite informed. So the first thing we're doing is spatial metabolomics. For our platform, we decided to do matrix assisted laser absorption ionization, uh, FTICR. So we're using our 15 Tesla Fourier transform ion cyclotron resonance instrument. And what we're doing is we're moving across, we're blading our ions, we're seeing where our metabolites of interest are. Well, with MALDI, you're getting, and same with NanoDesi, you're getting a mass to charge value. So you need to figure out if we're going to do integrated pathway, we're going to figure out how things are made. We need to have the actual identification for the metabolite. So uh, luckily, we have a lot of expertise at PNNL for these orthogonal techniques to do tandem mass spectrometry identification of our metabolites. We use LISA. We use ion mobility, we use liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry, and we also use uh, gas chromatography mass spectrometry. And I put a little, little pink star right here. Um, this is a paper we published, I think about a month ago now, and it has all of our favorite words of interest. So we're using DIA, 
we're using machine learning, we're using ion mobility. And what Ivette did is she built a peak decoder algorithm. So it enables machine learning based metabolite identification and accurate profiling in that multi dimensional data. Um, and if you just Google peak decoder, it'll come up. So I recommend everyone check the paper out. And we are adapting it over to proteomic measurements too. <laughs> and then once we have so we have, we're visualizing where our metabolites are, we're identifying them, and now we're going to do our spatial proteomics. So for this, we let the biology tell us the scale we need. So when we did this, micro scale is what we needed. So what we did is we did micro pots. So instead of nano pots, we switched it over to micro pots with Paul and then Ying also contributing to um, building this chip here. Okay, <laughs> now that was a lot of the big picture, so I want to step through it a lot. Um, so what we do here is that's that fungal garden. So you might be thinking of that initial picture and going, well, how the heck are you doing anything spatially there? It looked like maybe dirt, like a sponge. You know, how are you able to section it? How are you able to do this? Well, we found we could embed the fungal garden and many other types of samples too. And once we embed it, we can treat it just like mammalian tissue sections. We can section it. Um, it sections beautifully. Uh, we were very surprised and very happy by that. Okay, so we have our sections, and now we're gonna do our MALDI mass spectrometry imaging. Uh, based on what everything looked like, we chose 50 microns so that we could correlate the morphologically unique features with our metabolome hotspots of interest. So our microhabitats we wanna learn more about. Okay, and then here's the picture of Maria and Paul. So then we're gonna do our spatial proteomics. We're not gonna just randomly do it on everything. Instead, we're gonna target those tissue regions that contain these activity zones, and we're gonna liberate them from the slides with our laser capture microdissection and transfer them into our micropots or microdroplet processing in one pot for trace samples chip for our high sensitivity mass spectrometry proteomics. And what you get from that is, I mean, this, this is a zoom in. This was a, a little glass slide and we could zoom into it and we could see microhabitats that we were very interested in that we were getting information out of. So here we have four little microhabitats that I'll talk about more um, that we were able to just comprehensively pathway level data from. Okay, so if we think about our MALDI metabolite images, we take our section, we coat it with matrix because we're using MALDI. We use our 15 Tesla FTICR to, to go across at 15 microns as we're ablating all of these metabolites and recording the X and Y coordinates. And by doing that, we got 600, over 650 metabolite images from that. Now, when you think of MALDI, what you get is a, a relative intensity scale. So you know, remember, we had 650 here. So here I'm showing two. So yellow is high metabolite intensity, and then purple is, is low to no detectable signal. So if we look at our first example, so remember how I said we were really wanting to know how the system broke down lignin? Those really hard to break down aromatic compounds that are in polymer form? Well, we could actually see pretty easily low molecular lignin products. So we could see phenylpropanoids, we could see their corresponding acids, really cool, cool molecules like cumarate, vanillate, and we could see benzaldehydes. And remember, we have multiple ones of these. I'm just showing one representative image here. But when we looked at all of them together and looked at the co-localization, we could see three distinct microhabitats. So these are three distinct microhabitats of lignin degradation that we're interested in learning more about. And when we were doing this, we also noticed another signal that was just completely different. So the other observed spatial pattern had primary metabolites, soluble sugars, amino acids, fatty acids, and here it's represented by glutamine, but they co-localized to a single microhabitat here. And again, we're not entomologists, but we thought this might look like an ant egg or an ant wing. 
I'll show a picture. So this is the structure that was giving a completely different signature. We didn't really know what it was, but we went, let's see if we can use MIPI to figure out what it is um, in detail. So now we have our four microhabitats that we want to learn more about with our spatial proteomics. So we have our three lignin microhabitats in green there, and we have our red one here. And I keep showing just one, but we all know statistically one thing is not going to be enough. Um, so at least three bi biological replicates for each region were dissected and collected in the individual wells of the micropots chip and processed and analyzed. So laser capture micro section, get these microhabitats, put them in the chip. You see the, the ant microhabitat there. We process it and we take it to liquid chromatography to NMS spectrometry. Now, I don't know if any of you are familiar with metaproteomics, but it's a whole heck of a, a lot more. So we don't have one genome. We don't have a nice human genome to match against. Um, it's a lot more complicated. So what we did here for our metaproteomic analysis is we leveraged 147 leafcutter ant fungal garden metagenomes. We also did genomes of known residents, known microbes, and we used um, our protein prediction de novo metaproteomics method, which I have listed down here that we published in 2022. And with that, and also leveraging a PNNL supercomputer, we could create our reference database, which contained 50 million proteins of known members in the consortia that were grouped into 24 million clusters based on sequence similarity. So that means if we look at our genome, we know this peptide matches to one of these, you know, plants, ants, fungi, or bacteria. And we also put it into keg pathways. So we could say, not only is it from an ant, but it's participating in this molecular pathway. Okay, and I'll, I'll make this one bigger on the next slide, but just to orient you uh, to what we're talking about here. And then Runin and, and Yu Chin um, were our computational biologists that, that made that huge reference uh, metagenome possible. So just this is how we decided to display the data. It's very complex. There's a lot going on. So for each one of our microhabitats, so we have our green lignin microhabitats, one, two, and three. We have our red ant microhabitat. And then for each of these columns, we have bacterial peptides, fungi peptides, plant peptides, and ant peptides. And we also did our keg analysis. So we can not only see that it's there, who it belongs to, but what it's doing. Okay, so now here's the zoom in so you can actually see what's going on. Uh, so we had 7,392 unique and taxon specific peptides, and they map to 2,339 annotated protein clusters. And remember, we did our keg assignments here. We could do it on 93% of the clusters. And the take home is 195 of these had keg metabolo metabolomic pathways or metabolic pathways matched to it. So let's just look at the data. So remember, here's the unknown structure. Okay, here's our bacterial peptides, our fungi peptides, our plant peptides, and we were right. Here's the ant peptides. So it's screaming, it's definitely an ant. Um, so it's pretty cool that we could pick out that, that taxonomical assignment. Still don't know if it's an ant wing or an ant egg. So if we look here, we're getting a lot of signal transduction, that, that green bar there. So we looked at that pathway form, and we could see that amino acids were being made, proteins were being made, all of these new processes were just turning on. And based on that, we conclude this was indeed an ant egg. So it just got squished a little bit at the top, but it's the right size too. Now, if we look at our lignin microhabitats, so lignin one, two, and three, you know, who's degrading the lignin? We see here's our bacterial peptides. They're probably playing some role. And then we get to our fungi. So our fungus is absolutely the degrader of lignin, is correlating in there. And then this purple bar here, that's carbo carbohydrate metabolism. So that's our breaking down of our plant polymers. So we could see, so think back to that picture of that plant cell wall. Remember, we had those sugar polymers. So we had hemicellulose, cellulose. We also have pectin, chitin, and lignin. 
So the way that we have this set up is the presence or absence, the either the enzyme was detected or not detected. So we have our three lignin microhabitats up here in column four, and then we have our ant microhabitat here. And we say, this is the enzyme was detected or it was not detected. And we can say what species it's from. So if we look at this one, this one's an important one, it's an endoglucanase. It goes into the middle of cellulose and cleaves it and eventually will give rise to cellobios and glucose. And if you look here, it's made by fungus and it's in our lignin microhabitat one, two, and three, not in our ant microhabitat. Now, one really cool thing that we could look at, if we look at chitinase, so this is produced by both fungus and ant. So ants produce it because they want to break down their exoskeleton. And it's hidden behind here. But if we look at who was making each of these chitinases, these first three that are in the lignin microhabitat, they only match back to fungus. Whereas this one that matched to the ant microhabitat, it only matched back to the ant genome. So we're getting a level of data that, that really wasn't possible before. Okay, so I think I have four slides left and I wanna take some time on this one so you understand the next ones. Um, you know, I said in the panel, I'm a biochemist. So if you let me, I'll put everything in pathway form. So that's what we're looking at here. And we'll just kind of step through it. So here is our micropot enzymes. So remember, we just saw that table. So we have, here's our lignin microhabitat, one, two, three, our ant microhabitat. For this particular enzyme, benzylformate decarboxylase is involved in lignin degradation, breaking down aromatic compounds. We can see that presence, 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 absence. And if we look over at our moldy image of our substrate, so here we're seeing the whole picture, but we're focusing you know, this region corresponds here. So lignin microhabitat one, two, three, ant microhabitat. So we're seeing our substrate correlates nicely with the enzyme. And then we're getting the product that's made over here, same way as high in those green areas. The lignin microhabitats is not in the ant microhabitat. Now, because you guys are probably more interested in, in cool patterns than looking at lignin de degradation in general, I decided to focus on three neat examples that we were able to pull out. So this one, I say, okay, aromatic compound degradation pathways, same enzyme, two different reactions. So this top one here, this is the one that I went over on the previous slide. So we can see it's benzyl formaldehyde, formaldehyde decarboxylase. I can't even talk, formaldehyde decarboxylase. And it's taking it from our product we already talked about, our substrate to the product. And it also made over here a 4 hydroxy benzoate. So we can see that that enzyme, let's look at what the, the next enzyme is down there. That's better, too much talking today. It's also benzyl format decarboxylase. So it's the exact same enzyme, but let's look at what's feeding in. So if we look at the substrate, Benzyl formate is different than this one. And if we look over here, our product is benzoate. So we're actually able to see on the micro scale level, both the products, the substrates and the enzyme and that pathway level mechanistic information that we want. Okay, so for this one right here, this is the same product, two different reactions. So we look over here, so maleacetate over here, we can see it's in our lignin microhabitat but we have two completely different substrates and two completely different enzymes feeding into this. So if we look at our enzymes, we can see these were in the, the lignin microhabitat made by fungi and same here and missing from the ant. And we're getting that same pattern by our substrates too. So again, two parallel pathways, we're able to see that and detect that. And this is my last example. And I think it's really fun for a mass spectrometrist. So here we're looking at energy metabolism pathways, but we're looking at co-localized isomers and we're seeing two unique pathways. So, you know, the pattern that we've seen before, if you have an enzyme, it's gonna co-localize with your substrate and product. That just makes sense biologically. So when we looked at this one, l fuconate dehydrogenase, we can see, okay, it's in our lignin microhabitat. One, two, three, we got it there. It's not in our ant microhabitat. 
So we'd expect the same thing when we look at the substrate. So we look over here, this is l fuconate We can see it's in our ligna microhabitats, but it's in the ant microhabitat, that's strange. So we thought, well, what is an isomer that exists for l fuconate Well, it's glucose. Well, we can't differentiate it here, but the good news, news is a negative ion mode, glucose has a chloride addict. So we can search for that and see what that looks like. And yes, indeed, it was glucose. Glucose is specifically localizing just to the ant microhabitat. And so we decided to take it a step further. Can we see the enzyme that's processing it? So we can see glucose here. We can identify the ant enzyme that's processing it. Processing it. So hexokinase is not in our lignin microhabitats. It is in our ant microhabitat. And we're seeing that product, glucose 6-phosphate, specific to the ant microhabitat. So really, really cool resolution of data. If we just took it all, just bulk analysis and clumped it all together, we would be missing out on so much information. Okay, so for summary here, we can decipher microhabitats with microscale multi-omic measurements and really get that region-specific activities, and we can enrich them, and we can see what's going on there. And to do that, we're using MIPI. Um, so, you know, MIPI here, we're using our complex fungal garden, but it can really be applied to any type of heterogeneous sample that you can section. And we can integrate our data to get that mechanistic information um, that we all want. And then I tried to point out um, uh, a lot of the key players on the slides, but you know this is a, a huge community at PNNL uh, that helped with both of these research studies. Um, the first one was funded by NIH. Uh, HubMap that Neil mentioned also had a role uh, with this initial mammalian tissue study, and then Department of Energy, of course, uh, for the fungal garden. And one thing, um, you know, being a, a national lab is we love collaborators. So, you know, please reach out to us. We have a huge, excellent team. We love collaborations. We love writing grants together. And if you have a biological system that's DOE focused, we also have an EMSL user facility. So you can always write proposals and actually use our technology we develop uh, with those proposals. Okay, that will take any questions. Thank you very much for the great talk. It's really mm -hmm. interesting to see such complex systems at such fine micro scale. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a quick question first yeah. before I open it up. Um, I'm not an expert at all in metabolomics, but I do know there's some differences in how you search spectra and can identify things. Mm -hmm. and I was wondering what your opinion or what your experience is in uh, matching spectra. So for you collect a yeah. lot, but how much can you match right now for all these metagenomes? Yeah, so it's really, really difficult. And essentially, we're dependent on what exists in our metagenome. So we all know, as proteomics experts, if we don't have the exact peptide match in our genome, a lot of times it won't match to whatever's closest. So that's something we need to be aware of. With metaproteomics data, we usually you know, watch our false discovery rates a lot based on de decoy searches. Um, so for metaproteomics, you use MSGF just because we have a little bit more control over it. Um, with our mammalian samples, we use MaxQuan a lot and use match between runs. We do not use match between runs here. We need to see a good spectral hit for every single thing. Otherwise, we just don't believe it. So we actually will look at the raw spectra and make sure it matches. Yeah. And I guess just a follow-up question uh, for the metabolomes uh, library specifically. Um, is there any kind of progress you hope to see in terms of getting more uh, better quality libraries for these different species, specifically for their metabolomes? Yeah, yeah. Um, so a lot of times, you know, with metabolomics, we see the central um, kind of energy building things actually go across species, which is great. But when you're looking at things that are specific to, to fungi and specific to bacteria, you can get a whole host uh, of different things in there. So um, when we did our peak decoder software, that was focused on metabolites. Um, and we did make sure that we could buy different metabolites and, and put them into our database if we needed to. So, you know, become friends with someone that synthesized something well or or see if it's available for purchasing. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. We have a question in the back here. ABJ, hey, thank you. Yeah. And, uh, two questions, one sort of macro and one very focused on fungi. 
Um, mm -hmm. The macro one is, you know, is there another biological conclusion that came out of the system, even the one in the lab, like ants killing each other or, you know, is there, because it's such a complex, it's such a beautiful thing to see yeah. in biology, you know, is there beyond the biochemistry? Yeah. yeah, actually, we did have a follow up study. We just finished analyzing. Um, we're actually getting the data off the instrument. But one of our samples, we found that we had parasitic fungi on it and it gave a different signal. And it was a very unique metabolite profile and very unique proteins being turned on. So we did a whole secondary study where we introduced an infection and then looked at how it's temporarily changing. Um, so the data is hot off the press. Um, we're still analyzing it, but that is one one really cool thing that came out of it. So that's where the fungi are eating the ants. Well, it, no, it was a parasitic fungi. So it was a, a fungi that's not our main fungi. That's the healthy. We call it the healthy garden uh, fungi. And then so it was a pathogenic fungi that was just picked up from uh, the University of Wisconsin's lab. Oh, and so introduced you pathogen? You mean this? Or it was a, it's a fungi. So two fungi. Oh, fungi actually, eating other fungi. Eating other ones, yeah. yeah. So um, and everyone saw uh, the new, was it the, the Netflix series, The Last of Us? So, you know, yeah. we did a, a little interview on that and we said, uh -huh. you know, the best way we prevent this, you know, the, the fungi killing us all is we learn how good fungi protects itself and what molecules it makes to fend off the bad fungi. So, yep. Got it. Um, so we can save the world from the next zombies if we know how. Zombie fungi. Got mm -hmm. it. Never, didn't, didn't wake <laughs> up thinking I would hear that this week. Uh, but the, the second question is, is on, it's a good segue. The, yeah. So there's a lot of secondary metabolites. The, the fungi have an average genome size of, you know, 35, 40 megabases. And they have all of these, some of the species have dozens of secondary metabolism yeah. uh, gene clusters. And those are the chemical weapons they use. So, so if you use something like um, GNPS or spectral networking to, to interface with the natural products community for fungi. We have, and we have some experts at the lab that are kind of digging into that more. And I think we're just at the tip of the discovery because there's so many compounds that exist. And, you know, the natural library is so many of those folks have extended it and we have a great knowledge base, but I think there's a lot of things we just don't know exist. Um, and that's why when we think of drift time, um, so, you know, I mobility, ours was with a drift time system, but with Tim's top too, if, if you can start separating things by their secondary conformations, you might be able to get some better identifications for the small molecules too, at least seeing what class they fit into. Okay, so go fungi, protect ourselves. Yeah. Uh, there is a question from the audience. Would mm -hmm. you be able to apply this approach to feces? To feces? Yeah. For microbiome? I think so. And, you know, we haven't tried it, but if, if you can embed it, you know, our sample was more porous. So I don't know, but if you can, if you can take your sample, you can freeze it, you can embed it, you can section it, then why not? And then you look for those activity regions and it's going to have the same issue where you're going to have different bacterial species really spread out um, so that you'd have to figure out how to target those areas. But yeah, we, we do a lot of microbiome studies, so that wouldn't be something new for us. We've just never done it on a spatial scale. Thank you. And mm -hmm. I have another question of my own, which is for laser capture micro dissection. Mm -hmm. Uh, what were the challenges in yeah. doing that? And what would be the challenges in doing it with smaller uh, spatial regions and the high throughput? Yeah, I think, you know, when you get to, so with laser capture micro dissection, the way that, you know, the, the system set up um, is being able to capture, um, if you're using nanopots, then you have to be able to capture that little tiny voxel um, with the, the non-volatile solvent. So there, there can be an inherent error rate there. Um, so, and with laser captured micro dissection, you also can get burning around the edges. Um, you have to need to control your laser energy correctly. So there's a lot of different things that can feed into it that way. But um, you are keeping your micro environment intact. So I think it's, it's always a plus and minus. If you can isolate your cells, that's fantastic. But then with this, you're also kind of seeing that micro environment. And we saw in that, that NIH relevant um, paper, that the stroma cells were not equivalent throughout. You could take a stroma cell at the bottom of the mouse uterus and the top, and they were completely different. And the reason is because there was an oxygen gradient. 
that we'd never be able to see histology or visually, but it was actually controlling protein expression. And if we just took out all the stroma cells and did that, we might miss it. If you did each one individually, then you could probably figure out something was there. But. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much for your talk. We really appreciate the presentation.